Black Lives Matter. It's 2020 and it's shocking and appalling that we still need to stay that, say that phrase over and over again. I'm Gabriel Hutland. I'm an assistant professor in the Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Latino Studies Department. And I'm uh, in solidarity with the scholar strike happening this week and um, wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about why I think it's so important for UUP and for faculty at UAlbany and around the country to say Black Lives Matter and to come out for this action. Um, I want to specifically address two large and very important questions. Um, I won't do so in a comprehensive manner. I won't do so with the most knowledge and I'll do so by drawing on very important black scholars who have pioneered all of the knowledge that we have about this. Uh, in particular, I want to mention Kianga Yamata Taylor um, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, whose work I've found utterly inspiring and very, very useful. Um, so the two questions that I want to talk about today are why uh, did George Floyd's murder spark what have been called the broadest and uh, largest protest wave in U.S. history in the sense of being the longest and most extensive combination of protests. We saw protests in cities and towns across the country. It was a truly inspiring thing to uh, take part in. And we're still seeing protests uh, in my hometown, Rochester, New York, where tragedy happened in March and it's unfolding in the streets day after day. Uh, in Brooklyn, New York, where I live, um, in Albany, everywhere around the country, we're seeing these protests. So the first question I want to address is why uh, did George Floyd's murder spark this amazing uh, and so necessary protest wave? Um, and then I want to talk about what became the defining phrase, the defining demand of the most recent expression of the movement for black lives, which is the demand to defund the police. And I want to talk about how that connects to union issues, how it connects to education issues, how it connects to social justice issues. Um, the first question, there's many answers to. Um, we can list the names of black men and women who have been killed in recent years. Trayvon Martin, um, Breonna Taylor, uh, Daniel Prude, Ahmaud Arbery. We can go back to Emmett Till. Thousands and thousands of black men and women who have been lynched in U.S. history, the dark, dark stain that we have never dealt with in the proper manner. Um, we can talk about the police violence that uh, the black community faces on a daily basis. Um, being black in America is to confront unimaginable challenges and horrors on a regular basis simply for being black. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Uh, but why did George Floyd's murder spark this huge wave when uh, these other conditions have been relative constants in recent and unfortunately longer swath of U.S. history. Um, a huge part of the answer, I think, relates to the pandemic that we're experiencing and the fact that it was the African-American community as well as people of color more generally who disproportionately suffered uh, rates of illness and death. Um, we've seen that in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in cities around the country. Uh, where the proportion of the African-American community that got sick with COVID-19 and that died was dramatically higher than their numbers in the population in question. Um, and that's not a, a random uh, reason for that. It's in large part because African-Americans have suffered uh, so much discrimination, so much racism, they can't get provided with adequate health care. Um, they're often not listened to. Uh, the African-American community is also at the forefront, along with the Latinx community, of being essential workers in this country. Uh, so while other people had the luxury of staying home when there was work-at-home orders issued, when there was quarantines issued, uh, so many African-Americans and so many people of color in general didn't have the luxury of doing that. Uh, so to see the video of George Floyd getting murdered, and it's not recommended watching for everyone, it's so horrific, to see that happen in the midst of a pandemic that's disproportionately affecting African Americans and disproportionately affecting people of color, that explains in part why that particular event 
had the effect it did and led to wave after wave of protest, um, which uh, ironically and tragically elicited even more police brutality, even more instances of police uh, supposedly acting in the public order and instead macing people, beating people, tearing people out of cars, um, showing why so many people are angry and upset and demanding systematic action against systematic systemic racism that is unfortunately at the core of uh, the United States. So one of the main demands that was taken up in the protests was to defund the police. And that demand at its most simple is to stop uh, cities, stop states uh, from funding police departments. Um, as Kianga Yamada Taylor has shown us in a recent New Yorker article, the amount of funding uh, for the police in the United States uh, practically tripled between 1997 and 2017. Um, so there's a huge increase in the money uh, that has been going to fund police departments at the same time as we've seen decreases in uh, state assistance for uh, mothers with children. Uh, we've seen decreases in education budgets. We've seen decreases in social services. We've seen so many uh, things go on the chopping block, even as police are getting tanks, even as police are getting military-grade equipment. Um, and we've seen the uses that uh, that equipment gets put to. So the demand to defund the police is a profoundly simple and a profoundly just demand to redistribute that money, to demand other, to fund, excuse me, other things to fund education, to fund healthcare, uh, to fund uh, social services in the communities around this country. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives is intimately connected with uh, education justice movements, social justice movements, um, so many different types of material justice movements. We need to defund the police in order to have funds available for other priorities, which matter so much and which have been defunded already. Um, recently, people might have seen floating around on social media uh, one uh, question which says, people are up in arms, some people, not everyone, people are up in arms about the demand to defund the police. What about the everyday demand to defund education that we see over and over again? Um, so that's why uh, despite not being a scholar of, um, of uh, black social movements, I'm not a scholar of the U.S., I'm a scholar of Latin America, but I teach at the university at Albany. I live in New York. Um, I'm a citizen of this country, and so it's so fundamentally important to pay attention to what is happening on our streets, to pay attention to the history, and to demand actual real change that will address these uh, injustices that are so deeply rooted. So many University at Albany students um, have friends, have family who have suffered in the pandemic, who have suffered uh, from mistreatment by authorities, by the police, um, by so many people in this society. And we have to uh, take action to change that. The scholar strike is one small way of taking that action. It's one small way for educators, for union members around the country to say enough is enough, to say that we have to have a different system. And I want to be very clear that defunding the police connects to that broader set of struggles. It connects to the struggles for universal health care in this country. It connects to struggles for um, tuition that actually is affordable for students. It connects to struggles for a decent life, and it connects very much to struggles for union rights. Um, and for workers' rights overall. Um, if we had stronger unions in this country, what we saw this spring would have been very different. Um, there would have been better protections for workers. There would have been more worker power, more worker ability to say no to going to work in unsafe conditions. Um, so that's what this broader movement is about. It's a movement for economic and social and political justice. And... Um, it has to all connect, but we cannot lose sight of the uh, centrality of anti-black violence uh, in our country's history and in our country's present. It's unfolding every day, every week, all around us. And that's why we have to say over and over and over again until it doesn't need saying that black lives matter. Thank you very much.